Okay, so uh, go ahead and turn in your slides to chapter three. So we're still in that first staple packet. Um, this is the last chapter in that packet. Chapter three deals with something called encumbrances. Encumbrances. An encumbrance is a limitation. It's any type of limitation on the property. That's chapter four. Um, any type of limitation on the property from the standpoint of the property owner is an encumbrance. So that could be a deed limitation. Like, for example, fee simple determinable that we talked about in Chapter 2. Would that be a limitation on what the, the owner could do with the property? Yeah, then that would definitely be considered an encumbrance on the property. How about covenants? Things that are like covenants or restrictions that are placed against the property. Would that be an encumbrance? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So encumbrance, just when you encumber something, you weigh it down. It's heavy. So an encumbrance is just any type of a limitation of what you can do with the property. Sometimes that limitation is based on how you can sell the property. Sometimes it's based on what you can use the property for. But any type of limitation is called an encumbrance. And we're going to talk about several different types of them. The first one is called a lien. Real estate liens or liens that attach to real property are something called specific liens. They're called specific because the lien is attached to a specific piece of property, meaning a lien would attach to how many pieces of property? One. A lien would only be attached to one specific piece of property. So let's talk about what a lien is. Let's define a lien. And you need to put this in your notes because I think people don't ever get a basic definition in their mind for what a lien is. First of all, you owe somebody money. That's the root of a lien. You owe money to someone. When they have a lien against your property or against you, you owe them money. Now, if they have a lien against your property, we call that a specific lien. If they have a lien against you as a person, we call that a general lien. Which one of these do you think would be worse for you personally? A specific lien or a general lien? Yes. A general lien. A specific lien, folks, only impacts the property that it is attached to. What do you think a general lien would impact? Everything you own. Everything that person has. How many of you have ever heard of a judgment? A judgment is a general lien. When you get a judgment placed against you, what can they take from you in order to pay that debt off? Everything and anything that you own. An IRS tax lien is a general lien. A lien to the North Carolina Department of Revenue for unpaid state income taxes is a general lien. Those are exceptionally dangerous because they are attached to you as a person not to something you own, but to you as a person, so therefore they impact everything you own. Yes, ma'am, Mary. Uh, the second sentence under general lien says these have nothing to do with real estate. They don't have anything to do with real estate because they're attached to what? You, you as a person. But if you own real estate. But that's, you're, you're, you're looking for a connection that doesn't exist. If it attaches to you, it attaches to you, your children, your spouse, your, the, your, the shoes you own, the cars you own, the property you own, they don't have anything to do with real estate. They have to do with you. Real estate just happens to be one of the assets you own. We're not going to treat the real estate any differently than cash you have in the bank. If you have a general lien against you, what are they entitled to? Everything. All of it. And that's what we mean when we say it doesn't have anything to do with real estate. Uh, another way to say it is it has to do with everything, including real estate, because it has to do with what? The person. A general lien attaches to the person. The person is responsible for repayment of the money. Whereas with a specific lien, it's not ultimately the person who's responsible for repayment of the money. What is it that's responsible for repayment of the money ultimately? The property. The property is. Ultimately, the collateral that gets 
a lender paid when they have a specific lien is not the person it is the what property. it is the property because that's what the lien attaches to how would the property property don't have a checking account how would the property ultimately be held responsible for paying back the money they can sell it well it's not theirs how can they sell it they can take it through what process? Foreclosure. So when you think of a specific lien, what's the other word, F word, careful here, that you should think of instantly? Foreclosure. Foreclosure. The reason specific liens attach to property is that ultimately what a lien does is gives the lien holder the right to foreclose on that property. Now, we say take the property. They're not really taking the property they're selling the property out from under you because that's ultimately what a foreclosure action is a foreclosure action is not the bank taking your house it is the bank selling the house out from under you because ultimately what do they want their money back. they want their money and the property is the collateral that allows them to get their money back does that make sense for everybody that is a specific lien. We're going to talk about lots of different kinds of specific liens. I don't know why there's that sound effect. I have no earthly idea. I don't know, but drum roll, please. Um, so there's the right to foreclose. It only affects, a specific lien only affects that one particular property. So if I own five properties and one of them is foreclosed, are the other four going to be impacted in any way? No. 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 But if I had a general lien placed against me, could that impact all five properties? Yes. And it additionally could impact my bank accounts and my retirement accounts and any stock I own. Because a general lien, it's like, it's like, a, it's like an octopus, just those tentacles that attach and suck everything. That's why they're so dangerous. Specific liens are much less harmful to the person because ultimately what's the worst that could happen with a specific lien? You lose the property. The property is sold to pay off the debt. Does that make sense for everybody? So when we talk about specific liens, we're specifically talking about the foreclosure process. So mortgages, deeds of trust, we're going to talk extensively about these in chapter 14 and 15. To this point, Every conversation we've had about real property has assumed that we didn't have any debt associated with the property. One of the, here's one of the big mistakes that people make. They assume somehow that fee simple absolute means I don't owe money on the property. I own my house fee simple absolute. I would love to tell you I don't have a mortgage, but that would be a lie. I do owe state employees credit union about $175,000 still on that thing but I still have fee simple absolute ownership because fee simple absolute means, simply means what two things have not been limited by the grantor? Time or use. Time, I have unlimited time, I have unlimited use. I do have a specific lien attached to that property. State Employees Credit Union has placed a specific lien on that property because I borrowed money from them several years ago. And they've attached that lien. Do they ever intend to enforce that lien? We hope not. As long as I continue making a monthly payment, will they ever enforce that lien? No, because what does it mean when we say enforce a lien? What do you think? That's a, that's a really fancy, nice sounding way of saying what? Foreclose. Foreclose. Enforcing a lien. Because the only reason you attach a lien to a property is that you intend someday to have the right to do what with it? Foreclose. To foreclose on it. To take it, sell it, and get your money back. That's the whole purpose of the lien. So a specific lien, is that automatic? Something that happens automatic with uh, mortgages? Does it happen automatically? Well, no, it doesn't happen automatically. I agreed to allow that lien to be attached to my property. See, the bank can't just place a lien against my property. I have to agree to that lien. But they did have some leverage. How did they get me to agree to allow them to place a lien against my property? They gave me money, a lot of it. And that's why I agreed to allow them. And conveniently, they don't give you the money until they, you allow them to place the lien. The lien comes first. You let them place the lien, then they give you the money. So you don't really have a choice. What do you mean so I don't really have a choice? Well, sure, I don't either, have to borrow the money. Right, but if you borrow the money, I mean, the, the lien's going to be 
attached to that yet. That is correct. Okay. Well, would you would you let me borrow money on my good looks, or would you expect no. to have some collateral? See, the thing is, why do we have liens? Be honest about humanity. Why do we have liens? Don't trust people. Because we don't trust people. If we trusted that people would repay us, there would be no need to have liens attached to property. Does that make sense? We attach the lien because we don't trust you. That's the ugly truth. Yes, ma'am, Liz. So does that mean that whenever you buy a house that you have both a general and a specific because you have property tax? What, what, what about property taxes do you think would be general? Then they what? No, they cannot. Not property taxes. Property taxes are specifically. So what can they take if you don't pay your property taxes? That property. That's it. Now, property taxes are very different than income taxes. Income taxes are an example of a general lien. So which is it worse, to not pay your property taxes or not pay your federal income taxes? Federal income. Federal income taxes. You better believe that. If you don't learn anything else in this class, learn that one. Actually, worse than them, the North Carolina Department of Revenue. Pay them, folks. Because they will come after you long before. The North Carolina Department of Revenue puts you in jail with $50. And I am not kidding. If you owe them money, you better find a way to pay them. Every license fee, every dollar you owe them. You can work out a payment plan with the IRS. They'll throw you in central prison if you owe 100 bucks to the state of North Carolina. I mean, don't mess with them. Don't mess with them. Okay? But that's an example of a general lien because they're attached to the person. Whereas property taxes are an example of a specific lien. Okay? Good with that? All right? So, let's talk about, we're not going to talk more about mortgages here because we've got two whole chapters, much later, chapters 14 and 15, where we talk about mortgages. But mortgages are an example of a specific lien that, because they're attached to what? Property. That one piece of property, and only that one piece of property. Now we want to talk about something called mechanics liens, and not the kind of mechanic who might work on your car, but these kind. We call them tradesmen, or materialmen, or mechanics. These are people who provide either materials or labor to a property that you own. Materials or labor. So if Lowe's delivers a load of lumber to my property, are they a mechanic or materialman under this law? Yes. Yes, because they have provided either what? Material. Labor or material. In this case, they've provided material. If I don't pay them for that lumber, what do you think they have the right to do? File a lien. File a lien against what? The property. The property that they delivered the lumber to. So if they drop off a load of lumber in my driveway and I don't pay them for it, they can file a lien against my property. Now remember, what did I tell you a lien was? The right to do what? Foreclose. To foreclose on my property. So here's where you don't want to know the truth. You know, you know that Jack Nicholson moment, you can't handle the truth. This is one of those moments. Because you'll say that and then you'll be asked a silly question like, well, can the guy who I hired to put a rose bush in my front yard foreclose on my house if I don't pay him? What's the answer to that question? Yes, yes because a mechanic or a materialman is anybody who provides one of two things, either materials or what? Labor to that property. If they are not paid, folks, they can go and file a specific lien against that property, and the whole point of filing a lien is to have the right to do what? Foreclose. To, to foreclose. And so the answer, can that person who installed the rosebush foreclose on your house is? Yes. Yes, they can. As crazy as that may sound, yes, they can. And that person doesn't have, a, have to have a business license. They don't have to have any kind of special it can license. Neighbor down the road, it's yard it can be anybody that, as long as they can prove two things. As long as they can prove that they provided labor or materials to the property, and as long as they can prove that the owner of the property hired them to do so. So they need to show a written contract showing what they were supposed to be paid. And they would need to show that they did indeed provide labor or materials. And if they've got those two things and they have not been and they can prove they have not been paid, they have the legal right to file a lien against the property. Verbal agreements would count. Verbal agreements would probably not count in this case. I'm not going to say it can't. A judge could decide, but I've never seen a mechanic's lien be filed where there wasn't a written contract in place. There's no law that says it has to be that I'm aware of, but I think most judges would be very reluctant to file a mechanics lien against the property based on a verbal contract. Yes, sir. 
Okay, so say that you owe somebody like a hundred bucks for doing a job to your mm -hmm. property. Is there any way to, if they do file for a lien against your property, is there any way to compensate for that hundred dollars other than for closing? I mean, or this? Well, you, pay, you mean from the person who owes the money's perspective or is that from the, the lien holder's perspective, the person who did the work? The person who owes from the person who owes the money, just pay them their hundred dollars. Well, pay them their hundred dollars because once you pay them their hundred dollars, then they no longer have a lien against your property because you've satisfied the lien. Now, the reality is of the thing, and this is where you have to get outside of the little vacuum that I just created for you. Somebody who installs rose bushes is never going to file a mechanics lien against the property. How many of you have ever been to the courthouse? Nothing happens for free there. It's going to cost between $500 and $1,000 to file this lien. So if you go back to your question, I owe them $100. Are they likely to go down to the courthouse and spend $500 to file a lien for $100? Most likely not. Does that make sense for everybody? They have the right to, but having the right to and having the, you know, the want to are two different things. I mean, who wants to spend half their day going to the courthouse and filing a lien that's going to cost them $500 out of their pocket in cash, but they don't take checks down there, by the way. They do have an ATM in the hall that charges a very reasonable, like, $300 fee to get money out of your account. I've never, the biggest highway robbery in the world is the ATM at the courthouse. Have you ever seen that thing? Yeah. It's like sitting down, it's like a $12 fee. I mean, casinos would gag at that number. It's ridiculous how much that thing charges. And they only take cash. So, but you got to pay. So this person who's owed a couple hundred bucks would have to go in and pay another 500 to the county just to file the lien against the property. Now, of course, they wouldn't be filing a lien for just 200 at that point. They'd be filing it for 200 plus the cost of the lien. But still, who wants to dig $500 out of their pocket extra to try to recoup 200 that they're owed? It's just very unlikely. So most of the time, these things are going to get filed when the sums of money that are owed are pretty what? Substantial. Large sums of money. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So if they put that HVAC system in and they still own like the dollar dollars, instead of filing like towards the court, they can come on the property and take it back. No. Jackie's question is if they install an HVAC system and it's not paid for in full, rather than go file a lien, can they go take the HVAC system back? No, that's called grand theft. <laughs> That's still called grand theft. You can't, not unless you create, you, yeah, could you create a written contract where you were making payments on the air conditioner and expressly says if it's not paid in full, we could remove it? Sure. But you'd have to create a contract specifically for that. Remember when we talk about these rules, we're not talking about what you can do. We're talking about what happens when you don't do. Our most material men or mechanics going to have a specific contract that outlines what happens if you don't pay and we can come back and rip that thing out of your house? Or is this going to be something that needs to be resolved later on when people don't pay? Which one is it? Something's We're going to have to figure out a resolution down the road. That's what these rules are for. These rules are there for resolving these conflicts when people weren't smart enough to resolve them on their own. This is when the courts have to step in. So this is your your only legal recourse if you've installed that HVAC system and you don't have some other fancy agreement. Your legal recourse is to file a lien. You certainly cannot go on somebody else's property. Number one, that's trespassing. And remove something that's attached to their property, that's grand theft. Based on the fact that they haven't paid you for the thing. The, the legal response to that would be don't install it then until they what? until they pay you for it. You made that choice to install it before they paid you for it. So you should understand that your only legal recourse is to either wait for them to pay you or file a lien against the property. Which is probably why you'll encounter a lot of service providers that want what? Payment when? Up front. Because they don't have a lot of options once they've done the work. Yes, ma'am. Well, every state has rules about mechanics liens, but the ones we're talking about here, yes, are North Carolina specific ones. Did you have a question, Bryce? Can I see your hand? Yes, yeah, that's what it's You good? Okay. We good so far? See, you need to understand the essence of what a mechanics lien is first before we get into the rules of it. Because that's what happens. So often you try to run to, oh, I've got to memorize this rule, I've got to memorize this rule. And then I ask you a simple question, well, what's a mechanics lien? Uh, I know, 120 days. A mechanics lien is not 120 days. 120 days has something to do with a mechanics lien. But what is a mechanics lien? Specific. 
specific lane. Specific lane. That allows you to uh, lean against the property based on whatever uh, materials or labor you perform on the property. There we go. Is that a good definition of a, of a mechanics lane, a material yes. lane? It's a specific lane attached to the property on the basis that some service provider has provided one of two things. What are those two things? Material, material or labor to the property and have not been what? Paid, paid for. Because if they've been paid, they clearly don't have the right to file a lien. Everybody go with me on that? Now, the state does set up time frames for how long you have to file that lien. The, the mechanic, the material man, the worker, doesn't have an unlimited amount of time to file the lien against the property. They actually have 120 days from when they last worked on the property or last provided materials. So in the case of loaders dropping off a, a, a load of lumber, they have 120 days from when? From the day they did what? They dropped it off because that's the last day they provided material or labor. In the case of the HVAC company, they have 120 days from when? The day they walked away from the job and the HVAC system was functioning. Does that make sense for everybody? That's how long you have to file this lien. If you wait 121 days, guess what? You can't file the lien. Do they still owe you the money? Yes. Yes, but you've lost this method of trying to collect the money. Again, why is this a good method to collect money? Because it now gives you the threat of doing what with their property? Foreclosing. Is that a pretty big threat? Absolutely. That, this is a debt collection procedure, folks. That's what this is. This is somebody who owes a debt to a service provider, and they are using every tool at their disposal to try to get you to do what? To pay. Now, do you think most mechanics are going to run out and file a mechanics lien right away? No. No, because it takes time, it takes money to file it. How long are they probably going to wait? 115 days, right? They're going to give you as long as they possibly can in the hopes that they don't have to file a lien. But what you need to know for the test is what's the last possible day they can file that lien? 120 days after they finish the job. Is everybody good on that? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, say you have a $100 lien, you would obviously want them to also have to pay for the, the charge. The cost of filing. Before you start work, get them to agree to that. Or get them to agree to what? Uh, agree to pay for the cost of to file. You don't have to. So I, I got you. Good question. You don't have to get them to agree to pay court costs associated with trying to collect from them. What you would need to get them to agree is that they owe the hundred dollars. Okay. And so when you have to, if you have to file a lien as a means of collecting that money, then it's understood that they owe you the court costs. It's like any other lawsuit where you have to sue somebody. If you win the lawsuit. It's understood that not only am I suing you for the money you owed me, but I'm also suing you for what it cost me to get it from you. Okay. So it eventually, the, the lien that's attached to the property is not going to be for $100. It's going to be for the $100 plus whatever the cost of filing the lien were. Okay. Everybody understand that question? Okay. We good on that answer? Yes, sir, Bryce. So looking at this, the lien's got to be filed within 120 days. Mm -hmm. But the property has to be foreclosed within 180 days. That's my next point. Okay. That's exactly right. So what do we say enforcing a lien means? Foreclosing. Foreclosing. So they also have a time limit on doing that. This is where this kind of lien is very different from a mortgage loan or um, property tax lien. Because in the case of a mortgage loan or a property tax lien, how long do you think they have to foreclose? Six Forever. Months. Forever. If you hold them the money and you haven't paid them, they can what? They can foreclose. Mechanics liens are treated differently. Mechanics liens, we only give them 180 days to actually foreclose. And guess what? The clock starts ticking on both of these time periods at exactly the same time. So the 100, it's not 120 plus 180. It's a total of 180. So they have to file the lien by what day? 120, 120 days after they finished work. How much, if they waited until day 120 to file a lien, how much more time do they have to actually foreclose on the property? 60 Only 60 days. Only 60 days. It's a very <coughs> limited amount of time to foreclose with a mechanics lien. Everybody okay with that? Now, 
What if I said this? Liens are appurtenances. What does the word appurtenant mean? Attached to the property. Attached to the property. Run with the property. That means if I buy the property, the appurtenances come with the property, right? Yep. How long do they last? Forever. 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 And in the case of liens, forever until they're satisfied. So if Kevin buys a property with a mechanics lien attached to it, what's going to happen in the mechanics lien? It's going to stay with the property. And if they still have the right to foreclose, who do they now have the right to foreclose on? Kevin, Kevin on his property, because the lien stays with the property. the property. Does that make sense? So it would definitely be in Kevin's best interest to make sure before he takes ownership, there's no what? There's no liens attached to that property. If he's buying the property from Stephanie, he's going to say, no, 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 uh, you got to pay this mess off before you transfer it to me, because I don't want your liens. Does, does that make sense for everybody? You can't do it after the fact. You can't say, oh, I trust you, Stephanie. No, we don't trust you, Stephanie. I'm sorry. You know? So you, as a buyer, it does it become very important to make sure that there are no liens against the property. The good news for you is, where do I keep talking about that these things have to be recorded? At the county courthouse. So if they're there, are they going to be pretty easy to find? Yes. Absolutely. When we talk, later on, we'll start talking about things like a title search. One of the things we're looking at when we're doing a title search is seeing if there are any outstanding liens attached to the property because those liens stay with the property in spite of it being sold to somebody else. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Now, I'm going to tell you, while we're on the subject of mechanics liens, I'm going to tell you a horror story here about a mechanics lien. Think about this time frame. How long does a mechanic have to attach a lien to the property? 120 days from when? From when they finish work. Does it say anything about, like, unless the property gets sold during that 120 days? No. Hmm. So Stephanie puts her house on the market, and her real estate agent says, you know, you get a lot more for this house if we renovated the kitchen. So she hires somebody to come in. She hires a general contractor to come in and spend $40,000 for the new kitchen in the house. She doesn't pay them. She sticks that house on the market. She still hasn't paid them. Everybody with me so far? In this market, do things sell quickly? Uh-huh. Kevin comes in and makes an offer. Now, Kevin does his homework. He's smart. He, look, he goes to the county courthouse and checks those things. Is there going to be any liens against the property? No. No. I mean, the job was just finished three weeks ago, a month ago. He checks. There's no liens. He makes her an offer. They close 30 days later. We're only 60 days after the job was actually finished. Can that material then still come and file a lien against that property? Yes. As long as they're within their 120 day period. They can. And it's not going to be Stephanie's problem. Whose problem is it going to be to deal with? Kevin, Kevin ain't that ugly? Yeah. Ooh, that's nasty. Oh, receipt. Receipts. When Kevin went in, what was something that probably attracted him to that house in the first place? Why did he want to see it? New. Look at this new kitchen. Beautiful. Receipts, please. <laughs> see, if I show a house and it says new HVAC system, new roof, newly renovated kitchen, receipt, receipt, receipt. And not only that, I don't trust Stephanie still. I'm going to contact the people on that receipt as a broker because if I'm representing Kevin's best interest, is that my job? Yes. I'm going to contact the people on that receipt and say, did you put a roof on this house? Yes. Have they paid you for it? Yes. Can you send us something in writing saying that? Because we want to make sure to protect that buyer because could that lien be filed even after they close? Yes. Absolutely. It could. This actually happened in 2008 when St. Lawrence Homes went out of business. St. Lawrence Homes was a regional home builder based in Raleigh. St. Lawrence Homes went bankrupt. They were building houses one day and the next day they were literally out of business. And when I say they were building houses one day and the next day they went out of business, they just stopped. I mean, there were houses that were, some of them were 95% complete, some of them were 10% complete, some of them were just foundation, some of them were framed with no siding and no roof. What, what happens to a house that you just stop building, by the way, that doesn't have a roof on it? 
It deteriorates. Isn't that fun if you're the next door neighbor? I mean, people have to live with this mess for years. You know, I mean, does that become a hazard to everybody in the neighborhood? Yes. Sure. Here's the people that nobody really thought about when that happened. Because everybody thought about those people. Oh my God, you have this unfinished house next door to you. Or, oh my God, you, uh, you were building a house that's going to close next week. And now what do you do? And you pay these people a deposit. And everybody thought about those people. Nobody thought about the people who had just recently bought homes from St. Lawrence Homes. The ones who had just recently closed. Because guess what? Guess who St. Lawrence had not yet paid? All those subcontractors who did work on those properties. The framing contractors, the electricians, the plumbers, the landscapers, the concrete people. None of them had been paid. So in some cases, you had people that bought a house from St. Lawrence Homes for $400,000, and within two or three months after closing, they had another $300,000 in mechanics liens attached to the property. So does that give you a different perspective on representing a buyer? Are there questions you need to ask about things that are new? We actually changed the way we closed new construction houses in North Carolina as a result of that. Now, we expect the builder to give us a list of every subcontractor who's put their hand on that house from start to finish. And the closing attorney will go to every single one of those subcontractors and get them to sign a release saying one of two things. Either we've already been paid or even if we haven't been, we're waiving our right to do what? To file a lien against this property. Because we really don't care if they ever get paid. That's the ugly truth. If you represent the buyer who's buying a house, do you really care about the subcontractor if they get paid? No, you just want to make sure that what can't happen can't, you can't end up with a lien attached to the property later on down the road. Is everybody following me on this idea? So as a real estate broker, when you see new, what should you start to ask for? Receipts. Receipts. The, I mean, the only other really, and somebody said, well, you know, what's the safest way to do that? The safest way is to wait. If you go look at the property and you want to make an offer on it, great. When should you close and be? In 120 days. But the problem is not, not everybody wants to wait that long. That's the safest mechanism, though. The safest mechanism, view the property, make an offer, closing is four months from now. Because if the property stays the same for those four months and that lien hasn't been filed, we don't care because they no longer have to what? The right, the right to file it because they only had 120 days. Yes, sir? What happens if the, the contract, the seller says uh, that uh, he paid everything, the repairs, and his pleasure? they don't have to pay anything. So the question is a good one. What happens if in the contract the seller says we paid everything, you don't owe anything, yada, yada, yada? Well, in the case of a seller like St. Lawrence Homes, they went bankrupt, went out of business. What good does it do to have a contract with them? Because it doesn't change the rights of that mechanic to do what? To file the lien. The only thing that works is having the actual service provider sign saying, one of two things, either I've already been paid or I waive my right to file a lien against that property. So it doesn't do any good to get the guarantee from the seller. You need it from whomever did the work. That's where you need the guarantee. Yes, ma'am, Amanda. I just have a curiosity question. My brother's an HVAC um, installment person. Mm -hmm. does. Um, how does that work? Um, like, does he have to pay the guarantee? They are. So the question is, if a mechanic or materialman does work on a property and does not file the lien by the 120-day deadline, are they still owed the money? And the answer is yes, but it becomes like any other outstanding bill. You really don't have, and you can still sue them for it. I mean, you can still sue them because they still owe you the money, but what you've lost is a big debt collection tool. You've lost the biggest kind of, you know, it's like telling somebody, yes, you know, go out there and drive those nails in, but you can't have the hammer. You use whatever else you want to, but you can't have the hammer. Right. Well, what you really need is the hammer, right? And the, the mechanics lean is the hammer in this case. I was just curious, because I, I never thought about it. Like, I always knew this, but then since he's in it, I'm like, wait, but he doesn't get paid. Like, what happens? If he doesn't get paid, realistically, he needs to be filing the lien, most likely. Is everybody okay with that? He's going to leave. So, if, um, if a person, just It's all right, that happens to me all the time. I won't say what it means, but it happens to me all the time. Yeah, um, maybe we're going to see this when we get to the contract law part. 
but there's not a way where the seller can guarantee that there's no carving. Again, you're asking the wrong person to guarantee it. We've already established the seller's a scumbag. Oh, yeah. They have had work done on their property and have not what? Yeah. Have not paid for it. A guarantee from that person means nothing. It's useless. Even if we specify the says there's actually in this property there's not any possible pending lien. And again, who did, who you got a guarantee from? Oh well, that's right. The scumbag who has no money and who's not paying people. And so ultimately, sure you can get that guarantee, but that's not what's going to protect the buyer. What protects the buyer is either waiting out the 120 day period or contacting everybody who potentially could have done work on the property and getting them to say okay. that we're not owed any money. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you, you've spoken before about waiting for to um, close. Mm -hmm. Now, is that something, I've never bought a house before, so um, is that something you can push out to how long you want? It's not all that realistic in a lot of transactions. I mean, quite honestly, and it's not realistic from either perspective. A lot of times, neither the buyer nor the seller want to wait that long. But I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you that's the best possible route to go. That, that's the surefire route. Because even if we go get guarantees from everybody who did work on the property, there's always a chance that somebody did work that we don't know about. Right? That's always a chance we take. Is that a form of contingency, I guess? But again, a contingency doesn't accomplish anything. Y'all are looking at it in the wrong direction. A contingency is an agreement between the buyer and the seller. The seller is a scumbag. <laughs> Any agreement with them doesn't matter. They're clearly not going to do what they're supposed to do. They certainly don't give a shit what it says in the contract. So we're trying to protect the buyer legally. And there's only two ways to do that. That's either wait out the time period or what? Have the contractors sign something saying what? Wait, they waive. They waive their right. One of the two. Those are the only two surefire protections. And even the second one. That's exactly the two routes you would go. One of those two. You better do one of those two. That's exactly right. Yes, ma'am. Who is he and she and he and that? Oh, okay, now use it with seller and buyer. Who owes money? So, the seller. Okay. He owes $2,000. Okay. So, he's not having money to pay him to start selling. He's going to rush to sell the house. Okay. We're in the contract. We're going to pay the people off. Because that's where I'm still going to attack on like $2,000. Why would you give them more money because you're paying off their debt? Make the seller pay more. Or less. I mean, make the that's what I thought. That's why I wanted to make yeah, you talk through it. But you just didn't tack on, and I think you meant yeah, take yeah. away. Yes. We're going to pay. No, here's how you handle it. You simply say to the seller, pay the damn lien. You are going to have money, because I'm doing what? I'm buying the house. But I'm not going to give you my money until you take part of it and do what? Pay the lien off. I want to see. That's why we hire closing attorneys. Because that's what they do. They collect all the money, pay off all the liens before they give the money to the seller. See, we're not going to give Stephanie the money. Because she's going on litigation with it. We're going to give the closing attorney the money. And the closing attorney is going to pay off all the liens and then give Stephanie whatever's what? Yeah, Left over. That way Kevin, the buyer, knows that the liens have been what? Paid off. Does that make sense now? See, that's the protective mechanism. That's our job. Yes, sir. Okay, so going back to the scenario where the seller didn't tell the buyer about the lien, mm -hmm. you know, it stays on property, and now the new buyer is the owner of the property, and then he finds out about the lien. Yep. You know, days are coming up with foreclosure and freaking out and stuff. Yep. Is he in any right? Does he have any right to sue the seller? Absolutely. For those, for the he can sue them. But again, yeah, that costs more money. To go file a lawsuit, to hire an attorney, to go after somebody who may or may not have money. I mean, again, it's yes, you always have the right to sue. Well, they've got the money that you know you just paid for. The house. Maybe, well, maybe. They to you know, unless they went on weekends, they went to Vegas, they had a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Do everybody understand the yes, sir, Francisco. Um, how to protect a hundred percent the buyer in a hot market? 
or when there are many renovations that it doesn't appear in the listing or doesn't appear from your eyes. For example, if you change the wire, the electrical wire, the buyer cannot recognize that the wire are new. And if the seller doesn't mention, you never know that he, he changed it. And what happens if the seller that doesn't even pay to the so Francisco asks questions like the real estate commission does, the verbal diarrhea, right? You know, like, I'm not picking on you, by the way. Because your question was summed up in the first thing out of your mouth. How do you 100% protect the buyer? There's only one answer to that question. Oh, yeah. What do you do? Receipts. Well, Even receipts, not 100% because somebody yeah. might have done work. Like he said, he did all that. Somebody might have done work and you don't recognize the work's been done. What's the only surefire way? Wait, Wait 120, days. 120 days. That's the only surefire way. Yeah, but this is not practical. And so there you go. So there is no practical way to protect them. So you can't, you, what you've done is you close a question that has no answer. There is no way to 100% protect a buyer who is not willing to what? Wait. You cannot. So all we can do is warn them, you are taking a chance by closing within that 120 day window. That's the truth of the matter. It's like saying, how can I 100% protect myself against illness but not live in a bubble? Well, there is no way. The only way to 100% protect yourself is to live in a bubble. So we take risks associated with it. We don't always like that answer, but it's the answer. And that's, that's the thing about real estate. You always have to recognize somebody's taking a risk somewhere along the way. We take away as much of the risk as we can, but we can't eliminate it always. Yes, ma'am, ma'am. Um, my, so my only responsibility as a broker would be to um, tell the buyer that the safest thing is to wait 120 days is not practical. So I can check the receipts that I am knowledgeable about, but after that, it's not my responsibility. That's exactly right. Nobody's going to hold you responsible as a real right. estate broker for this kind of a scenario where it's something that reasonable people would have never guessed this has been done. There's no sign of it visibly. So they, 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 what exactly it's going to come back to is, have you warned them right. about the potential for this? Okay. That's what it comes down to as a real estate broker. So in your scenario where you say you get the money <clears throat> to the... Uh, Closing attorney? Closing attorney. That's a scenario where you kind of committed to go along with making sure that the seller is going to pay the lien because you're giving the money. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, the seller has to pay the money through the closing attorney. Co closing attorney. So who do you think the closing attorney represents at a closing? Whose best interest is the closing attorney looking out for? Buyer. The buyer. So when we get to closing statements and you see the closing attorney's fee is $1,000, who's going to pay that $1,000? The buyer, because their function is to represent the buyer's best interest. Because what they're going to do is collect all that money and not release any of it until they have paid the lien. So we're not going to rely on the, on the seller to pay the lien. The closing attorney is actually going to pay the lien. And then they're going to give the seller the difference. So in a case where it's not practical, that's kind of the... That, again, that's the, that's the second best thing. That's exactly right. Is to try to get a list of everybody who's done work and verify that they've been paid or pay them. Gotcha. You know, so a lot of times if you go to closing on a new construction house, you'll see you may be paying the builder $500,000, but they may only be walking away with a check for $35,000 because there might be 15 subcontractors on there that are on that closing statement that are being paid out of the closing. So if you run into a situation where you've had people, even though you uh, advise them, they're like, no, we really want this house, we want to go with it. And as long as you've covered your bases That's and they exactly understand right. what they're doing, That's exactly right. you'll proceed. Yes. Okay. I mean, you don't have any choice because, as Francisco correctly pointed out, it's not practical. If right now in this market, not only does the buyer not want to wait 120 days, most of these sellers are getting multiple offers. They're not willing to entertain an offer that pushes closing out 120 days because they've got three other offers that close in a month. And so practical and perfect are not, you know, sometimes in the same zip code, right? And so we have to do what is practical. And, and practical almost always works. But the key thing here is to warn them about the potential for the other. Yep. Yes, ma'am. No, you're fine. Um, but I thought the commission was supposed to be to protect the people. The public. They are. So wouldn't, I, I feel like. From whom? From us. From us, not from other members of the public. That's what the core system is for. You can't protect the buyer from the seller. Who does the real estate commission protect the buyer from? From real estate brokers. 
That's exactly right. So what would the commission be looking to see that had happened in that transaction? If one of these liens popped up after closing, what kinds of questions? Think about what Amanda said. What are they going to be looking for? Were, were you aware? Did you check? Did you even bother to look? Did you warn the buyer about this potential? And did you do your best to get any receipts for work that had been done? If you've done all those things, what's the real estate commission going to say to you in that transaction? Job well done. <laughs> they really are. Does the interest change if the closing is paid by the, by the seller? Does the interest change? Does who the closing attorney represent change based on who you must have bought a new construction house before? No. I've seen, I've uh -huh. seen the closing fees paid. I would say to you, think about the question you just asked. Who is an attorney going to be loyal to? The one paying them or somebody else? The one paying them. You're going to come into contact with this a lot in your real estate career. Notorious new home builders. Well, we'll pay for the closing attorney as long as you use our preferred attorney. Bullshit. No, we are not. No, thank you because I know who they represent. I know who they're looking out for, and it ain't my client to buy. No, thank you. We'll pay that $1,000 because I want somebody on my buyer's side, <coughs> not somebody on the seller's team closing this thing. This is a question, but it made me think about it. I just thought of it a couple two years ago, and I kind of get the feeling the whole time that our person was representing our interests as opposed to the builder's interests and so this made me think about, I could do this myself, inside the own position and stuff. But, but that point about um, whose interest is the attorney's, you know, is, is really, I think, the question because I realized even then that my interest won't be in, you know, take care of. Right. It, it that if way. you're using their attorney, they're not. Because very often, so here's the truth of when you use the builder's attorney, most likely you're using the attorney that the builder paid to draft the contract. And if the builder paid the attorney to draft the contract, who do you think they paid the attorney to draft the contract in favor of? The builder. And now you're hiring the same attorney to close the transaction? Who in that is looking out for the buyer's best interest? And, and they can't force a buyer to use a closing attorney, so they do the next best thing. They simply say, well, we'll pay for it if you'll use ours. Well, you, what you should really ask yourself is this is you got to become a cynic. If you're going to be a good buyer's agent, you got to learn to become a cynic. So the first question that comes up to me is why is it worth a thousand dollars to them? Why is it worth it to them to pay for it? What are they getting out of that deal? Why, why are they so whole hog on us using their attorney? Got to be some reason they want to do it. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Yeah, because there's going to be stating that you're going to be responsible for the liens. Right. Going to be well, they, they, they just, I mean, there's a thousand different ways that you're not getting a full measure of representation. And I'm not saying it's going to go badly. Somebody could buy a new construction, use the builder's attorney, and never have a problem. But that's not why you hire an attorney. You hire one in case it does go badly, right? Because here's the problem. Five years down the road, you have a problem with your closing. You go to close that, you go to call that attorney back. You know what they're going to say? I'm sorry, you weren't our client. Right. You don't need to call, call your own attorney. And then you're going to say, bro, I didn't have one. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> is that a difference there? Yeah. Absolutely. And so it's still the, the, the builder's contract. You're just having your third party. Review it. Review it. And look over and look for the gotchas and that are in there. Why? I'll give you a perfect example. Later on today, we're going to talk about something called excise taxes. North Carolina state law says excise taxes are paid by the seller unless otherwise agreed by the two parties. So in almost every transaction, excise taxes are paid by the seller. It's just it's what the state law says, right? But they put in there, unless otherwise agreed by the parties. If that builder has their own contract, what do you think they have in there about excise taxes? Who's going to pay them? The buyer is. Folks, on a $500,000 house, the excise taxes are $1,000. It's $1,000 they just saved themselves because you allowed their attorney to close a transaction with a contract their attorney drafted. They just made their $1,000 back up right there. And so if you having your own attorney who reviews that and would sit there and put a line through that and say, nope, pay by selling. And that's exactly what they would do. Boom. And they would attach a copy of the statute right to it. Nice. Saved you the $1,000 right there. Cost to the attorney right there. Just saved. I, I cannot stress that enough. Don't use the builder's attorney. It's not worth it. 
by my opinion. And I've been doing this a long time, and I've sold hundreds of new construction houses. It's not worth it. Don't use, don't, two people don't use. Don't use the builder's preferred attorney, and don't use the builder's preferred lender. Right. So I'm sure you've had a lot of talks buyers always to work through and say, because I've always say tried to stress good. to them there's a reason they want you to use that person there's a reason they're pushing you to use that service provider there's something in it for them that they're not telling you in using that service provider the whole purpose of having these other people come to the table is to represent your best interest and you're taking your own you're taking all of those people who are supposed to be looking out for you and you're hiring their folks to do it I mean, imagine if you were on trial for murder. Would you go to the district attorney's office and say, hey, I'd like to hire a good attorney. Y'all got anybody down here? You can, I mean, you'd be a damn fool, right? And I was like, but that's essentially what you're doing in a transaction like that. So don't do it. Okay? Everybody good with that? I know that's longer than we plan to spend on this, but it's a good conversation because it gets you in the mindset of what we actually do in protecting these people. Now, remember, all of that only applies if I'm on whose side of the transaction? The buyer's. If I'm on the seller side, folks, I'm not doing any of that. If they, if they, if they want to use my seller's attorney, great. Right. Awesome. And that's the other thing you've got to realize about real estate brokerage. Yeah. This is a team sport. Yeah. You always have to ask yourself first, what side are you on? Right. Am I on the seller side of things or am I on the buyer side of things? I eat as a broker in charge. As a broker in charge, the questions... I got my agents I finally have them trained because they would come in and they start blurting out a question we have this contract we have this blah 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 blah, blah and I stop what side are you on because guess what folks my answer is almost always going to be what different based on what side we're on think about the realities of a contract what's good for the seller is what is bad for the buyer I need to know what team we're on before I can give you advice. If you're ever given advice without bothering to check to see what side you're on, you're wrong. Especially on an exam. When you start answering agency questions later on in an exam, one of the first things you need to sort out is who's on what team. So like in your question, you brought this up, so I'll, I'll circle back to it, Stephanie. You said you kind of got the feeling that your person, I'm assuming you're talking about a real estate broker, was not really representing your best interest. Well, the real question is, were they supposed to be? Who were they? Were, were they a buyer's agent or were they the so seller's was, agent? And, and I'll be honest, the builder's agent was a little bit more helpful. Okay. So I was able to go out and say Well, that. and that's a perfect and that's a perfect example of just because that builder's agent is working against you in the transaction doesn't mean they can't work with you, right? And so we often get confused about that. And when we get to agency questions, people are like, well if they're the if they're the seller's agent, they would never be talking to the buyer. Of course they would. Their job is to do what? Sell. sell the property. You can't sell a property if you don't talk to a buyer. Right. Does that make sense? But who's their loyalty with if they're the, the seller's agent? Sell. Their loyalty is with the seller. So yes, they'll be glad to help you. Mm -hmm. Help you a lot. <laughs> but whose best interest are they looking out for? Sell. The seller. Because there are some things where there's not really a conflict. There are a lot of things. Like, for example, I always love people to say this. Oh, I'm dealing with the on-site agent. They're awesome. They help me pick my countertops. They help me pick my cabinets. I bet they did. I bet they were real helpful. They told you how pretty that upgraded countertop was, didn't they? Nah. Did they tell you to choose the basic package? Or did they say, oh, if I was you, I'd really think about these cabinets. Which one are they going to say? The upgraded ones, because who do they represent? A seller. Yes, they're very helpful in that way. Super helpful. Just like car salesmen are helpful in that way. Because the more they sell, the more they make. Okay, are we good? Okay, this idea of a mechanics link? All right. Oh, I talked so long, my clicker went off. That's how long you said. It's been too long on one slide. So when we talk about specific links, we said they are pertinent, which means they do what? They go with the property. They stay with the land until they're satisfied. They stay with the land. Now, let's talk about the priority of them. Priority just means where you stand in line. Lean priority is all about who gets paid first. Is everybody with me on that? Who gets paid first? And this is a very important real world topic right here. This is the order in which liens are going to get paid whenever the property is sold. 
Doesn't matter what the reason for the sale is. Remember, a foreclosure is a sale. Does that make sense for everybody? Foreclosure is a sale, a voluntary sale, any sale, any transfer of ownership, this is the order in which liens get paid. Here's why this order is so ultra important. In a normal transaction, this order doesn't matter. Because in a normal transaction, there's enough money to pay or satisfy all the liens. When do you think it's important to be first in line? When there ain't enough food on the buffet. Where you are in line matters a lot. Because if you're at the end, what are you going to have to eat? Nothing. Eat nothing. Because <laughs> there's not enough to go around. So where do you want to be in this order, especially in something like a foreclosure sale where there very well might not be enough money to go around? You want to be at the top of this order. You want to be higher in priority. Does that make sense for everybody? So here's your priority. Since the state is making these rules, who do you think they're going to put at the top of the list? Themselves. Themselves. Shocker there, right? <laughs> so the first lien priority, property taxes and something called special assessments. Now I'm going to go ahead and talk about what a special assessment is since we've come across this verb issue. It's a type of tax, but it's a tax for a very special reason. Sometimes the city, the county, the, the state, will come along and they will make what we call an improvement on your property. What did we say an improvement was last week? An improvement is anything that adds to the value of your property, right? So in the case of a special assessment, sidewalks will be a good example of an improvement that the city may decide to make to your property. The city decides, like right now, for example, I live in Cary. live in an older neighborhood in Cary. There are sidewalks on one side of the street on my street. Most of the streets in, in my area have sidewalks on both sides. My street has sidewalks on one side. Thankfully, not my side. They're on the other side. Do I have control over not having a sidewalk on my side, ultimately, though? No, because if the town of Cary decides that there needs to be a sidewalk there, guess what they're going to do? They're going to put a sidewalk there. But whose sidewalk is it? Everyone's. Yours. Mine. Whether I wanted it or not. It's mine. And who has to pay for something? You. The person it belongs to. So who's going to pay for the sidewalk that I didn't ask for, that I did not want? I am. I'm going to pay for the sidewalk that I didn't ask for and that I didn't want because the town decided I needed one. So much of that free country thing you thought you were living in, right? And because I probably don't have all the money to pay in one lump sum, they're going to put me on a payment plan. That lien becomes attached to my property until it's what? Until it's paid. And if and when we sell the property, that lien is going to go all the way to the top of priority. It only sits behind what? Property taxes. So when the property sold, what's the first lien that's going to get paid off? Property taxes and then what? Special assessments. Once we pay those, then we come down to the next level. The next level are going to be the mortgage loans. And notice it says mortgages in the order they are recorded. Remember, anything that attaches a lien to a property, so we have to do what with it? We have to take it and record it where? The court. At the county courthouse where the property is located. So if the property is in Wake County, what courthouse do we have to go to? The Wake County courthouse. It's not about where we are. We can't go to the courthouse closest to us. We've got to go to the courthouse in that county where the property is located. And so those mortgages, how many of you ever heard of a first mortgage and a second mortgage? We call them first and second. That number means something. First means it was recorded first. And that also means it's going to get paid what? First. first. So once we've paid the property taxes and special assessments, then we're going to pay the first mortgage. And then if there is money left over and there's a second mortgage, then we're going to pay the second mortgage. And only then, if there's money left over, are we going to get down here finally to our friends where? Mechanics. The mechanics lien. So that's another reason you'd have to think long and hard about whether or not you actually wanted to file a mechanics lien against the property. If you've gone, are the liens against the property going to be readily available? Yeah, can you find them? So the HVAC person, they just put an HVAC in this house, Amanda's brother. Can he go look up the liens that exist on that property? Yes. 
Yeah, and here's what he finds. A special assessment lien, this year's property tax lien, and two mortgages. What are the... <laughs> Instead of his like, just let it go. Because what are the odds that if he were to actually foreclose on this house that there would be enough money to pay off special assessment lien, property tax lien, two mortgages, and still pay himself? Is he probably going to run out of money before he gets there? Yeah. Absolutely. Like he wants to be the first one, though. So, but it doesn't matter if it, he, he might, being first in that race is still a loser yeah. because there's not enough value there. So, if I was that HVAC person, I would look at the liens before I did the work, right? And if I found, so if I go out and visit somebody's property, let's say I go visit Jenny's property and she wants an HVAC system and I look and she has no mortgages. Am I probably willing to put an HVAC system in there for her without her paying for it in advance? Probably, because if I file a lien on her property, there's a very high chance that if I had to foreclose, I can get what? I can get my money, because there's no mortgages sitting ahead of me. Does that make sense? But if I go look at somebody's property and they got three mortgages and they owe a special assessment lien, and they're like, well, just put it in and I'll pay you on it. I'll be like, mm-mm. Mm-mm. Pay me now. Because the lien is going to be pretty worthless. Does that make sense? Because of the priority. Is everybody understanding that idea? The priority matters a lot when it comes to getting paid. Okay? Um, why am I not clicking now? Um, deed restrictions, we'll talk a lot about more in Chapter uh, 6. I'm going to leave those alone for right now. You don't need to worry about a lead pendant. You can skip over this slide or a writ of attachment. Those are just things that are designed to stop a sale for a certain amount of time, but we don't need to talk about them in detail at all. Lee pendants, it looks like list pendants, I know, but it's pronounced Lee, it's a Latin word. Lee pendants means litigation pending, that's what it means, or writ of attachment. Those are tools that attorneys use to keep you from selling property to avoid having to pay a judgment. So like, for example, if, let's say Bo owns a house and he's being sued, by somebody. One of the things he might try to do to avoid having to pay them the money is liquidating all his assets, right? If he liquidates all his assets now before the judgment comes in, he can maybe hide the money offshore in the Caymans or do all those things. So a good attorney who's suing him would first go file a writ of attachment or a lee pendants against everything he owns because it's going to have the effect of doing what? stopping him from selling it because it's like a warning to the buyer saying don't buy this because there's litigation pending about it. Okay. That's all those are. So, we won't be tested on this. No. Okay. No. Okay? So far so good? Alright. Let's do this. Um, easements take a good while to discuss. So let's go ahead and take your lunch break since we only have one break. Let's take your lunch break and come back at, uh, say, 1235, okay? And then we will do, uh, we will talk about easements. We'll come back. 35.